Last week's homily was easy. We all heard that we wanted to be happy. And we were filled with the joy of the Advent liturgy, God Ate Sunday, Rejoice Sunday. But this week, this fourth Sunday of Advent, short though it is, is even sweeter, God's love. We all want love. And whereas for happiness, we can put obstacles up to happiness. Consciously or subconsciously, we can block it. There is no obstacle for love. You can't block it. God's love especially, no matter what you do, it is there. In fact, God's love holds us in existence. We might feel like we're unworthy. We might not think of God's love. We might not respond. But God says, my love falls upon us like rain. It falls on everyone, the just, the unjust, the deserving, the undeserving alike. And God has blessed us with his love. God has blessed us that image of rain. Literally, we lived it out this week, right? This downfall, people in Arizona are like, well, it never rains like this. It just downpour down. Where is all this rain coming from? You know it's coming from El Nino, right? The weather, the oceans warm every seven years, so the El Nino pattern. The rain is coming from El Nino. And God's love comes also from El Nino, El Nino Santo, the Christ child. Jesus brings God's love and warms not the ocean, but our hearts. And so God downpours us just like that rain coming down in the desert. God floods us with his mass today and then come again for Christmas. You won't even have time to forget the homily. Be filled with God's love and it will already be Christmas. This prepares the way for Christmas. We can't do any better. God wants to flood us with his love. And his love, as I said, is unconditional. God teaches us through the Old Testament, especially we hear King David, that we can't do anything to deserve this love. It comes to us despite our moral failures, despite our striving, okay, for a perfection, okay, I, I got to be worthy for this, I got to do this. It's not our work. God teaches us through King David. I don't know if you know the stories, how morally corrupt he was. Just to name adultery, murder, okay, just to name a few. But he had a repentant heart, he came back to God. And now we hear the story today in the first reading said, okay, God, I repent. I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build a house to worship you. Here I am living in luxury, he says, so I'm going to build a house for you. And God says through the prophet Nathan, go tell my servant David, says the Lord, should you build a house for me? It is I who took you from the pasture to care for the flock, to be commander of my people Israel. Notice God teaches David that he's going to make him a shepherd of his people. He took him his job as being a shepherd of the flock to come and be a shepherd of his people. But God says, it's not you doing the work. The shepherding is me. I want by your care of others, your care of the people, they should experience my care, my love. God says, I have been with you wherever you went. I will fix a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. In other words, through this love, he wants to give people peace. He wants to give his people peace. God does his work through human instruments, unworthy though they are. God wants to teach his people to cooperate with his care, to share his care with others, so that as we care for one another, they may feel God's love and God's love for ourselves in the caring. So David tries his best to care for others, to be a ruler of others. But to be honest, it's hard for human beings not to make it about oneself. Trying to care for others, people have different attitudes. King David, he became protective of his people. Okay, must I might fight for everyone and fight this. Other people have different ways. Maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's worrying about everyone. In our care, we can try to do it ourselves. And so God's always teaching us, let go in our care. Care for others, but let go. There's a spiritual reflection we have throughout the year. I could unpack it sometime. It's called detaching with love. 
Being detached, but be fully loving. It's a paradox. You have to be detached to love. I've heard other people say it. This one young, LG, LG. What? Let go, let God. In our letting go, then we can experience love. In our letting go, then we can love people properly. God is teaching us through David this lesson. And God says, I will remain faithful. God promises David, I will raise up an heir after you. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever, and your throne shall stand firm forever. Now, if we follow the history of David and his family after, generation after generation, they fall farther and farther until finally the kingdom falls apart. And you say, God's promise fails, whereas it's actually human beings that fail. But God remains faithful to that broken kingdom of David, the kingdom after generations that fell apart. There's no kings anymore. It's only corrupt leaders. Despite that apparent failure, God remains faithful. This promise that we hear to Mary today You heard about her saying, the child to be born to you will be of David's line. The child to be born to you, Joseph, Mary's engaged to Joseph. They're not yet married yet. They're saying they're not living together yet. They're engaged but not married. And said, this child will be born of David's line. God restores the promise to David. And so Mary helps fulfill this kingdom, and so does Joseph. By Joseph taking in Mary and the baby Jesus to her home, he takes him into his bloodline. He might not even realize what he's doing. Joseph is living out in Nazareth. I heard one biblical scholar says he's living out in Hicksville, out in the stick somewhere. He's living out there in Nazareth as a trademan. But we hear about in the gospel story, he goes for the enrollment of the census. And where does he go? To Judah, to the tribe of Judah, that David's king in Bethlehem, where the kings were born. The kings were made kings. He goes, that's Joseph's family line, a line of kings. He doesn't even know or doesn't live his dignity, but he brings out, he brings Jesus into his line of kings. So Jesus reestablishes God's promise. And these images of the Old Testament are supposed to teach us confidence in our lives. What God says, his love looks like this. When God promises, his love is going to change the world, change the way we care for each other, and change ourselves. But Mary has a part to play. She has to say yes. We notice that Mary has done nothing to deserve this. She just shows up. The angel shows up to Mary and says, this is what's going to happen. She said, how is this going to happen? She says, I don't even know a man. I haven't yet married my husband. We haven't been together. How will this happen? The angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And says, fear not, Mary. God's favor is with you. The words that the Bible uses, God's favor, God's gift. It's caritas. God gives this gift. God's gift And the angel finally says, it'll be the Holy Spirit. Once again, is God's gift. God giving him very self. God's love. God for the Son is so concrete. What does that love look like? It looks like the Holy Spirit. In theological terms, that love of God is so strong that we call it a person. The love of the Holy Spirit is something so concrete, it's a person. God gives himself. And the Jesus and the love of the Holy Spirit, and even as we talk about it, it's like, how does this make sense? It's hard theologically. You, you explain it, and then, but how does that make sense? I don't know. It doesn't make sense. You can't really explain it. You can't really understand it. And we should feel exactly like Mary. I don't understand this. How God gives his love. What does that look like? It looks like the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? It's a person. How is that God? I don't know. But that's what God says. And what does Mary say? I don't understand it. 
but I accept it. I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And so Mary is blessed. She inaugurates Christmas. She inaugurates the salvation of the human race, changing the way we act, taking us away from our sins so we may love properly, we may be filled with God's love, and may have love for others, bringing peace into our lives and to our world. Mary started that by her saying yes. And that's why we call her most blessed among women. But as beautiful our Catholic theology, St. Ambrose, a doctor of the church, wrote, just as Mary is blessed, here's what St. Ambrose said. You also are blessed because you have heard and believed. Isn't that amazing? St. Ambrose, doctor of the church, says, you also are blessed like the blessed Virgin Mary. You also are blessed When a soul believes, Ambrose says, when a soul believes, when you have faith, you conceive and bring forth the word of God. Mary brought forth the baby Jesus. But Ambrose says, if you say yes to God's love, you will also bring forth Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. You have Jesus in you. Just as Mary is blessed by saying yes, So God wants you to be blessed by saying yes to his love. That that love is so concrete, it transforms your life. It is expressed by physical deeds. Anything you do at Christmas, maybe, you know, this last week we've been frantic, getting ready for Christmas, and just let go. Let God, let that love come in. Do our best, but everything, let it be an expression, a way to show God's love. This is a special time. After this last Mass, we were just greeting people. Someone was going to greet them and have a great Christmas. I'll see you in a day, 24 hours, something like that. He said, oh, no, Father, no handshakes on Christmas. Give a hug. Allow our gestures, allow whatever we do, giving gifts, sharing meals, maybe a phone call. Allow our expressions of God's love. As you care for others, it's a physical manifestation of God's love. That's the way God wants to work. He wants to work through human instruments, unworthy though we are. But as we open up, as we say yes, like the Blessed Virgin Mary, as you say yes to that in faith, you will receive God's love, God's charism. By the way, just a little aside, the Greek word for charism, kairos, is a similar root word for joy, that root word us. When we're filled with love, we're also filled with joy. So it renews that Christmas spirit, something we all desire to really be filled with joy as we're filled with God's love. As we say yes, we'll be filled with joy as well. So as we say yes to that gift, that charism, God gives us the gift of love. It's going to be the greatest Christmas gift you can receive. To say yes in faith, you receive God's love. And as you receive that, The promise, it will transform every aspect of your life, everyone you encounter, everyone that you share with. You have the opportunity to share that love as we encounter God's love in the Eucharist and this Christmas, when we open our hearts in faith to Jesus and the love of God. Amen. Amen.